Okay, everybody, let's do the daily Bible reading. It is October 13th, and October 13th of 2020 is a Tuesday. Tuesday, so bless your day uh, wherever you're at in the world and whenever you tune in. This may be another October 13th besides 2020, depending on what we do with this series. I'm not really sure yet, but let's see what's uh, going on in the in the Word today. October 13th, we're still in the Weeping Prophet here, Jeremiah chapter, let's pick it up at chapter 22, verse 1, all the way through 23, 20. And, you know, this has all been about God speaking to the people that have rebelled against him, turned into all kind of idolatry, worshiping other gods. If they, if they, if they do anything with the Lord or pretend, God knows their hearts. It's kind of, he knows it's lip service. Their hearts aren't with him. Isn't that an interesting thing? Remember, that's the key thing. They're pretending religion sometimes, but their hearts aren't really with the Lord. They don't really love God. They don't really want to follow him. They're just like, well, we better, you know, check off the list. Let's go worship God at his temple so we stay out of trouble. That's not a relationship. So anyway, Jeremiah has got a word from the Lord for Israel, the whole nation, Jerusalem, Judah, and so on. Chapter 22, a message for Judah's kings, and this is what the Lord said to me. Go over and speak directly to the king of Judah. Say to him, listen to this message from the Lord, you king of Judah, sitting on David's throne. Let your attendants and your people listen too. This is what the Lord says. Be fair-minded and just. Do what is right. Help those who have been robbed. Rescue them from their oppressors. Quit your evil deeds. Do not mistreat foreigners or orphans and widows. Stop murdering the innocent. If you obey me, there will always be a descendant of David sitting on the throne here in Jerusalem. The king will ride through the palace gates in chariots and on horses with his parade of attendants and subjects. But if you refuse to pay attention to this warning, I swear... By my own name, says the Lord, that this palace will become a pile of rubble. So God's telling them how to live rightly and to honor his name. A message about the palace. Verse 6. Now this is what the Lord says concerning Judah's royal palace. I love you as much as fruitful Gilead and the green forest of Lebanon, but I will turn you into a desert with no one living within your walls, I will call for wreckers who will bring out their tools to dismantle you. They will tear out all your fine cedar beams and throw them on the fire. People from many nations will pass by the ruins of this city and say to one another, Why did the Lord destroy such a great city? And the answer will be, Because they violated their covenant with the Lord their God by worshiping other gods. A message about Jehoahaz. Verse 10. Do not weep for the dead king or mourn his loss. Instead, weep for the captive king being led away, for he will never return to see his native land again. For this is what the Lord says about Jehoahaz, who succeeded his father, King Josiah, and was taken away as a captive. He will never return. He will die in a distant land and will never again see his own country. Wow, what a harsh judgment. There you go, folks. Message about Jehoiakim. Verse 13, and the Lord says, What sorrow awaits Jehoiakim, who builds his palace with forced labor? He builds injustice into its walls. Oh, people, for he makes his neighbors work for nothing. He does not pay them for their labor. He says, I will build a magnificent palace with huge rooms and many windows. I will panel it throughout with fragrant cedar and paint it a lovely red. But a beautiful cedar palace does not make a great king. Oh my gosh, people, this is such... You hear this? Now, this is one of those moments where it's speaking to a particular time and a king, but it's a reminder about leaders, about bosses. If you're a owner, a boss... Do not oppress your people, and leaders of a nation should not oppress the people. And, you know, well, there you go. Hmm. A beautiful place, a beautiful palace, any place where leaders live, 
that does not make you a great leader. Hmm? Your father, Josiah, also had plenty to eat and drink, but he was just and right in all his dealings. That is why God had blessed Josiah. He gave justice and help to the poor and needy. So see, justice is important to the Lord. Even in our nation, in our day, that's why the church should be on the forefront of demanding leaders to do well with laws of the land, demand righteousness and justice in the land, to declare nobody's above the law. Doesn't mean we dishonor leaders. I love our leaders. I pray for all of our leaders. We don't want to dismantle police departments. This isn't about that. But when there's trouble in the camp, righteous leaders have to clean house. Do we get that? And Christians call for our leaders to say, look, nobody's above the law. No, but we're not blaming everybody for a few bad apples, right? That's the key, real justice, not anarchy, not craziness, not just burning down the house because you got to repaint a room. <laughs> get that? We don't burn down the house because we have to fix something. There you go. So he gave justice and help to the poor and need and it needy and everything went well for him. Isn't that what it means to know me, says the Lord? But you, you have eyes only for greed and dishonesty. You murder the innocent, oppress the poor, and reign ruthlessly. Therefore, this is what the Lord says about Jehoiakim, son of King Josiah. Quote, the people will not mourn for him, crying to one another, alas, my brother, alas, my sister. In other words, they're not going to be doing that when he's gone. His subjects will not mourn for him, crying like, Alas, our master is dead. Alas, his splendor is gone. He will be buried like a dead donkey, dragged out of Jerusalem and dumped outside the gates. Wow, he was not popular, folks. Weep for your allies in Lebanon. Shout for them in Bashan. Search for them in the regions east of the river. See, they are all destroyed. Not one is left to help you. I warned you when you were prosperous, but you replied, Don't bother me. You have been that way since childhood. You simply will not obey me, says the Lord. And now the wind will blow away your allies, and all your friends will be taken away as captives. Surely then you will see your wickedness and be ashamed. There is a good time for people in rebellion and being wicked to be ashamed. All right, we don't have to walk around in shame and be beat ourselves up if there's not a cause for it. But when people come back to the Lord, there is a place that they should change from their shameful ways. Verse 23, it may be nice to live in a beautiful palace paneled with wood from the cedars of Lebanon, but soon you will groan with pangs of anguish, anguish like that of a woman in labor. Uh, a message for Jehoiakim, or Chin. Verse 24, as surely as I live, says the Lord, I will abandon you, Jehoiachin, Je son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. Even if, you were the, even if you were the signet ring on my right hand, I would pull you off and I will hand you over to those who seek to kill you, those you so desperately fear, to King Nebuchadnezzar. And there's we've read about him, right? And we'll see more of his story in the in other prophets' books. Of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon and the mighty Babylonian army, I will expel you and your mother from this land, and you will die in a foreign country, not in your native land. You will never again return to the land you yearn for. Why is this man Jehoiakim like a discarded broken jar? Why are he and his children to be exiled to a foreign land? Oh, earth, 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 Listen to this message from the Lord. This is what the Lord says. Let the record show that this man, Jehoiakim, was childless. He is a failure. For none of his children will succeed him on the throne of David to rule over Judah. Hmm. Chapter 23 of Jeremiah, The Righteous Descendant. What sorrow awaits the leaders of my people, the shepherds of my sheep, for they have destroyed and scattered the very ones they were expected to care for. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to these shepherds. Instead of caring for my flock and leading them to safety, you have deserted them and driven them to destruction. Now I will pour out judgment on you for the evil you have done to them. But I will gather together the remnant of my flock from the countries where I have driven them. 
I will bring them back to their own sheepfold, and they will be fruitful and increase in number. Then I will appoint responsible shepherds who will care for them, and they will never be afraid again. Not a single one will be lost or missing. I, the Lord, have spoken. For the time is coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up a righteous descendant from King David's line. He will be a king who rules with wisdom. He will do what is just and right throughout the land. And this will be his name. The Lord is our righteousness. Wow, what a powerful name. Who is that? That's Jesus. In that day, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. In that day, says the Lord, when people are taking an oath, they will no longer say, as surely as the Lord lives, who rescued the people of Israel from the land of Egypt. Instead, they're going to say this. They will say, as surely as the Lord lives, who brought the people of Israel back to their own land, from the land of the north, and from all the countries to which he had exiled them. Then they will live in their own land. Judgment on False Prophets, verse 9 of chapter 23. My heart is broken because of the false prophets, and my bones tremble. I stagger like a drunkard, like someone overcome by wine, because of the holy words the Lord has spoken against them. For the land is full of adultery, and it lies under a curse. The land itself is mourning. Its wilderness pastures are dried up, for they all do evil and abuse what power they have. Even the priest and the prophets are ungodly, wicked men. Wow! I have seen their despicable acts right here in my own temple, says the Lord. Therefore, the paths they take will become slippery. They will be chased through the dark, and there they will fall. For I will bring disaster upon them at the time fixed for their punishment. I, the Lord, have spoken. Verse 13. I saw that the prophets of Samaria were terribly evil too, and for they prophesied in the name of Baal a pagan god, right? And led my people of Israel into sin. But now I see that the people of Jerusalem are even worse than that. They commit adultery and love dishonesty. They encourage those who are doing evil so that no one turns away from their sins. These prophets are as wicked as the people of Sodom and Gomorrah once were. Therefore, this is what the Lord of Heaven's armies says concerning the prophets, which these are the false prophets the Lord's talking about. Quote, I will feed them with bitterness and give them poison to drink, for it is because of Jerusalem's prophets that wickedness has filled this land. This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says to his people. Do not listen to these prophets when they prophesy to you, filling you with futile hopes. They are making up everything they say. They don't even speak for the Lord. They keep saying to those who despise my word, Don't worry, the Lord says you will have peace. And to those who stubbornly follow their own desires, they say, no harm will come to you anyway. Ah, foolishness. Have any of these prophets been in the Lord's presence to hear what he is really saying? Has even one of them cared enough to listen? Wow, folks, that's so important. We have to listen for God's voice. Look, the Lord's anger burst out like a storm, a whirlwind that swirls down on the heads of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not diminish until it has finished all he has planned. In the days to come, you will understand all of this very clearly. And for the sake of the daily reading, on October 13th, we'll pause there. They're stopping at verse 20 there. So here you go. We'll pick it up at chapter 23, verse 21 tomorrow. Wow. Jeremiah, I know it's heavy stuff. All right. October 13th, today's psalm is Psalm 83. Let's hear what Psalm 83 has to say. Hmm. A song of, it's a psalm of Asaph. The theme here is combating God's enemies. This psalm is a prayer for God to do whatever it takes to convince the world that he is indeed God. Someday all will recognize and admit that God is in charge. Yes, Lord. Asaph are one of his relatives, it says. Psalm 83. Oh God, do not be silent. Do not be deaf. Do not be quiet, O God. Don't you hear the uproar of your enemies? Don't you see that your arrogant enemies are rising up? They devise crafty schemes against your own people. They conspire against your precious ones. Come, they say, let us wipe out Israel as a nation. 
we will destroy the very memory of his existence. Wow, that's interesting. We even hear Israel's enemies today speak those words, right? So throughout history, Israel has always had enemies. Sad. Verse 5, yes, this is what their unanimous decision. Wow, this was their unanimous decision. They signed a treaty as allies against you. These Edomites, the Ishmaelites, the Moabites, the Hagrites, Gibalites, the Ammonites, and the Amalekites, and people from Philistia and Tyre. Assyria has joined them also and is allied with the descendants of Lot. Wow, craziness. Verse 9, do to them as you did to the Midianites, Lord, and as you did to Sisera and Jabin at the Kishon River. They were destroyed at Endor, and their decaying corpses fertilized the soil. Like, let, let their mighty nobles die as Oreb and Zeb did. Let all their princes die like Zeba and Zalmunna. For they said, let us seize for our own use these pasture lands of God. Oh, my God, scatter them like tumbleweed, like chaff before the wind. As a fire burns off forest, and as a flame sets mountains ablaze, chase them with your fierce storm, terrify them with your tempest, Lord. Utterly disgrace them until they submit to your name, O Lord. Let them be ashamed and terrified forever, and let them die in disgrace. Then they will learn that you alone are called the Lord, that you alone are the Most High, supreme over all the earth and oh as always remember folks when you hear the prophets or old covenant psalmist or people in those times praying they're crying out from their broken hearts and from the tragedies and all the torment and you know in that time it was a different approach remember we don't pray about our enemies in that fashion though jesus taught us to pray for our enemies and bless those that curse us so just remember even when we read that in a period of time we don't do it and we i never pray that way lord dash my enemies against a stone you know we don't pray like that anymore we like we pray for protection from the lord Lord, we pray for victories in certain situations. We pray for protection. Yes, we can do all that, but we never speak curses. Okay, there you go. And October 13th, today's New Covenant reading is 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 1 through 12. So here you go. We're in the new book. Remember, we finished 1 Thessalonians, and we'll continue with Paul's letter, a second letter. And let's just dive right in. I won't do footnotes or anything. Here we go. This letter is from Paul, Silas, and Timothy, like 1 Thessalonians, uh, Thessalonians, right? We are writing to the church in Thessalonica to you who belong to God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Dear brothers and sisters, we can't help but to thank God for you because your faith is flourishing and your love for one another is growing. We proudly tell God's other churches about your endurance and your faithfulness in all the persecutions and hardships you are suffering. And God will use this persecution to show his justice and to make you worthy of his kingdom for which you are suffering. In his justice, he will pay back those who persecute you. And God will provide rest for you who are being persecuted. And also for us when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven. He will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God and on those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will be punished with eternal destruction, forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. When he comes on that day, he will receive glory from his holy people, praise from all who believe. And this includes you. For you believed that we told you about him. So for you believe what we told you about him. So folks, again, another scripture emphasizing the decisive things about God, that people have to choose the Lord, but the church doesn't stand in judgment. What we as the church do is we hold up the banner of Jesus. We hold up truth in the earth and let God break through the darkness of people's soul by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. We don't go to wars, or we shouldn't. That was the Dark Ages. We're not doing that. 
It's spiritual warfare, principalities and spirits and the work of the enemy, Satan. But we call, we pray for mercy and breakthrough and the goodness of God to break through the darkness so that people learn the truth. Because right there, Paul, again, throughout all of New Covenant, it affirms there is a place of eternal destruction forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. Those words, no matter what language you're translating from, means what? Eternally and forever. Okay, I'm just emphasizing that. Some of you would might think, well, okay, Carl, yeah, I get that. But there's a big movement in the earth that just feels like, well, you know, all roads lead to God, or doesn't matter whether, whether we believe or not, even, you know, even atheists will go to heaven at some point. Or, you know, <laughs> there, are, there are some groups that think that the devil will get saved, or the devil will just be forgiven at some point. That's an awesome thought. That would be powerful grace. And that would be unbiblical grace, because that's not what the Bible points to. Uh, but do we rejoice in that? Are we happy about that? No, but it makes it more sobering and serious that we proclaim this. So anyway, there you go. Uh, good news, they will be punished. Okay, and we finish this, and this includes you, for you believed what we told you about him, verse 11. So we keep on praying for you, asking our God to enable you to live a life worthy of his call. Maybe he, may he give you the power to accomplish all the good things your faith prompts you to do. Then the name of our Lord Jesus will be honored because of the way you live, and you will be honored along with him. This is all made possible because of the grace of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, there you go. That's an interesting phrase, too. Paul's affirming, though now, you know, they're not bringing in the Holy Spirit here, but they're the grace of our God, Lord and Lord Jesus Christ. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the Trinity. If you've ever wondered how that works, I know it's mysterious. The Bible doesn't use the name. It doesn't use that term. But scriptural, solid scriptural theology and doctrine is clearly about the triune character of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We, we just... We hold to that and never let it go. Don't let anybody ever throw a curveball at you and make you think, well, you know, some script, the scriptures never said that. It's always saying that. You just got to read the whole thing. All right, there you go, folks. That's October 13th. We're going to pause there as they recommend. Tomorrow we'll pick up chapter two. Have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow for another daily Bible reading. Bye-bye.